All right. We are live, Myth Vision Podcast. Are you tired of the same old boring discussions about the Bible uh, pertaining to what we've been hearing for centuries, if you will? Today, you're going to hear something I'm certain is radically different interpretive wise than what you typically hear among Bible research and Bible students. Is what we're reading in the Bible to be taken at face value? Or are there interpretive models that might actually be talking about other things like the heavens, the sun, moon, the stars, astrology, and the ancient world, as you saw in the thumbnail? You're seeing a zodiac sign on the floor, a mosaic on the floor on a Jewish synagogue right there at the break of the first century, second century, third, fourth century AD. So we're going to be diving deep today, and I hope that you will stay tuned Cherry pick what you hear and what makes the most sense to you, but maybe you hear something you've never heard and things just click. So I hope you enjoy. Hit the like button, check out the description, subscribe to our guest, and stay tuned. Here we go. All right, welcome back to Myth Vision, and our guest today is Micah Dank. Welcome, my friend. Hey, buddy. That was a fantastic introduction. It almost sounds like someone else might have wrote it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I uh, I took the first sentence and yeah, then I just that. ran with it myself. But uh, you know, <laughs> know. it is. It was such a catchy thing. I used the chat GPI, GPT, sorry, and I was like, all right, and I was with Micah showing him. That, that was a catchy phrase. Like, are you tired of the same old interpretations that you hear? And that's actually relevant to what we'll be doing today. You have a presentation for us. And just for a moment, for everybody who's tuning in, you have a YouTube channel. Uh, I hope people will go subscribe to. You've been doing this for a little while. Go right. show them some love. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. What do you have going on here at this YouTube channel? Like what specifically? Oh, here's how it's basically. The YouTube channel is broken down. So all the information that I've had stored in my head. I, I have a book deal and it's basically an open-ended book deal, but I'm, my eighth book just came out. I have eight book series called Into the Rabbit Hole and I have a ninth book called A is for Aries. That's a children's astro theology book for six to 11 year olds. Even with all that that I wrote, all the information in my head, I still had more. So I started a YouTube channel a few months ago. Okay. What I have is I have three playlists. If you want to just go to the playlist real quick. The, your first playlist is the interviews. I do interviews on my channel, but I don't consider myself a podcaster. I just get interesting people on and I want to hear their stories. So I've had a, a lot of interesting people on. My second one is my astro theology section. As you can see in the astro theology, there's 30 videos. I have, I have, you 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 blow it'll blow your mind was as you go through these videos to see the cipher that i came up with how it's found in all the ancient holy texts my third video my third playlist right there is the short bombs where basically in anywhere from two to eight minutes i just try and blow your mind with information you might not have heard about and those are my three playlists um i would suggest people come by and watch the short bombs first if you want to see what i'm all about and my book series is basically an amalgamation of all that information and story in story foundation. When you're talking about astro theology, a lot of people don't know about it, but it is getting more popular. And um, what I've done is I've written a uh, it's, it, it's going to be a nine book series. I have to write the last mm -hmm. book, but um, it's it's going to be a nine book series, which is basically a mix between like Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code and how Dan Brown writes with all the cryptograms and anagrams and that the mind blowing information that I drop and astro theology. It's a way to teach people who are new so that it's kind of soft red pilling people in a way. Okay. Okay. So you also have, uh, or actually, well, I hope people will go subscribe. I want to let everybody know, of course, join the Patreon, everybody. I give a lot of content that I'm going to be editing here soon with lots of scholars who've been meeting in person. I've got another one, Kip Davis, Dead Sea Scroll scholar, Hebrew Bible scholar, who is coming to my house here in the next week. 
So don't miss out on being able to ask your question and me recording that in 4K. So I hope people will stay tuned, go subscribe, join us, support us so that we can keep doing what we're doing. All right. So what we what we planned on doing today is you're going to be giving a presentation. We'll probably stop around halfway. Yep. Um, I don't want to get lost in super chats to a point where we can't continue the presentation to try and bang out the other half. But you're saying we'll take a short break to try and address any questions that are in super yeah, chats. What I'm going to do. So a lot of it is biblical decoding with the codex that I've come based on the zodiac. <clears throat> Then after the book of Matthew, it kind of switches gears and goes back more into the historical information okay. while still decoding things. So it kind of switches at that point. So I figured that was a good midpoint. That sounds good. So I want to let everybody know, um, don't judge till you're here. And then once you're here, make your own mind up. I am in no way trying to tell you that you need to think the way that Micah thinks. And in fact, I told Micah before, I've dabbled in uh, astrotheology for a while. Um and there are some things that I still do think are the case, but we also need to define what it is, right? So I imagine you'll go into this and yeah, I'll give it to you right now. I'll give it to you right now. Astro theology for you people who don't know, and even for you people who do know, who want to hear a refresher, since I'll start from the beginning. Astro theology is the mythology of the Zodiac and how it applies to hidden codes within the ancient holy texts. Now, my cipher that I've come up with based on the 12 signs of the Zodiac, which I'm going to teach you, can be used to break down any books, any biblical passage, any ancient. I've done this to the Epic of Gilgamesh. I've done this to other Sumerian tablets. I've done this to the Enuma Elish, that's Babylonian, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Code of Hammurabi, where we get our law structure from. I've done this to the Quran. I've done this to the Book of Mormon, the Apocrypha, the Gnostic text, the Colburn Bible. Pretty much any ancient text that you think is holy, I can touch base with this and use it to decode. And I'm going to teach it to you. I'm going to teach okay. this. So I, I am obviously letting everybody know I'm interested in seeing what you have to say. I am a skeptic, right? And I'm very cautious about how far we can do certain things. And But I want to see what you do, how you're bringing this information. And at the end, we'll take Q&A. We'll ask questions of the audience. And I myself might tell you where I lie and where I'm, what I think about it at the end. So let me just give everybody a background on myself, okay? I am not, I am not a theologian. I am not an academic. Okay, I'm just the guy that's been studying the Bible for 30 years, the occult and the esoteric for 20, and astrotheology for 11 years. And what I'm going to show you is what I believe to be the case that the most interesting people and the people that can provide the most amount of knowledge to things are people who are self-taught as opposed to people who have to work within an academic scenario. Now, with that being said, I've done this presentation on over 200 podcasts over 550 times. I'm excited to bring it here today, Derek, because you're a little skeptical, but you have the background in the Bible, so I can bring you into the conversation because you have the background where you still believe some of it makes sense. What I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you this like I would teach a child this, and it has nothing to do with how intelligent I think you are. It has to do with the fact that I bring people who know nothing about this and I bring them along, and then by the end of this presentation, they have a good idea of what we're looking at. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so let me share. And you tell me when you have this and if you could this up so everyone can see. Yes. We're good? Yep. I start by saying, employ your time in improving yourself by other men's writings so that you shall come easily by what others have labored hard for. And now, are that, you going to be sharing the screen? Like, is it going to fill up the screen or is it, are we going to be seeing your, your, cause I see all the slides on the side as well. Yeah, I need, I need that. I need that. Okay. Okay. Um, so this was Socrates and this is what I just told you. You know, I've been studying for about 60 years. These, if you add it all up 60 years, these things, I teach something called syncretism, which is how all the sciences fit together. I have a Jewish background. I grew up in a conservative Jewish household. I never took to it. I can read Hebrew and I can understand a lot of the stuff that was going on at the time. So let me just show you this real quick, which right away, let's get something a little controversial. The scriptures are made up of holy sciences, metaphysics, astrological, which you're going to learn all about today, everyone, anatomical, 
alchemical, spiritual, esoteric, and mythology. It's also a gematria, an etymology, and a numerology book. There's 10 holy sciences in the Bible. Each one of these sciences requires you to study them as long as I've been studying astrology. There's more information. I am making the case that there is more information in this holy Bible than there is years in your life to understand it. And it's meant to humble you. However, I stick to the fact that they are not literal, they are not historical, they are not reality, and they are not original. And we're going to get into that. So this is the zodiac wheel right here, okay, with Capricorn at the bottom and Cancer on top. This is how the zodiac wheel looks, because at the very top of Cancer is the longest day of the year. That's the summer solstice. Okay, and Aries on the left and Libra on the right. This is how the zodiac wheel should look. If you see a variation on it, doesn't mean it's incorrect, but this is how it properly looks in the heavens. Now, astrotheology or astrology, I have traced back 17,000 years to the Lascaux Caves. It survived the previous Dryas Cataclysm. This survived the Cataclysm. Here you see an article that says the Lascaux Cave paintings are 17,000 years ago. The world's oldest cave paintings show that humans understood complex astronomy 40,000 years ago. So what happened? There are these caves in Lascaux, France. That's why it's called the Lascaux Caves. It's not in any specific reason other than that. They just happen to be in Lascaux, France. Some teenagers went into it. And it's very similar to the story of the shepherd's boy who went in and found the Dead Sea Scrolls. They went into a cave. When they went into the back, here's an example of what they saw on the wall. Now, on the top, you see the two bulls. On the right, you see the lions. And on the bottom, you see the horse. Now, they quickly realized that the bulls were Taurus, the lion is Leo, and the horse is Sagittarius. It's just missing the guy with the bow and the arrow. So what they did was they called in some people, and they called in some people, and then they called in some scientists who carbon dated these bulls. Now, carbon dating, okay, I agree with Christians, is inaccurate, carbon-14 dating. However, up to 50,000 years carbon dating, half-life dating, is incredibly accurate. Beyond that, you need some uranium datings or some different form of carbon datings. So this came out to 17,000 years ago. So what they did was they noticed the signs. They brought in an astrologer with a computer because we have the technology to do this now. They ran a program that rewound the sky back from where they were located 17,000 years, and they printed it out just to see. And what they did was they printed it out, and they superimposed it on the wall, and all the constellations lined up. So they had understanding of astrology 17,000 years ago. More importantly, too, or not more importantly, but just as importantly, the cave that they went into on the summer solstice, June 21st, the sun shone into the cave and bounced off the back of the wall, illuminating these pictures, and only on that one day. So it was a man-made cave because of that, and these are man-made drawings that lined up with the constellations. Now, in the Bible, there are questions you can ask. How Jesus was able to heal the blind, how he walked on water, how he turned water into wine, why he had 12 disciples, why he was betrayed with a kiss by Judas. Why he was dead for three days. Why is his birthday on December 25th? Now, all that is going to be answered before we take our break for um, this is all astrology. Now, Genesis 1.14 says, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. And that's basically what this is. It's just an amalgamation of that. Now, each zodiac sign is called a house. There's other words for it, too. An era, an eon, a sign. There are many words for it, but calling it a house is one of them. So at this point right now, I'm going to go through the 12 signs of the zodiac. I'm going to give you key words in each sign that represent the sign that you can connect logically to the sign. And then we're going to use that cipher, those key words, to decode everything. So I start with Aquarius, which is the first sign that I talk about, which is the man with the water pitcher. Now, technically, Aries begins the astrological year. However, because it's kind of our new year, I just start by explaining Aquarius because it's right around our new year. It goes back to the story of Zeus and the young boy. The explanation for Aquarius is a Greek story. Zeus saw a 14-year-old boy on heaven who he absolutely adored. 
and he wanted him, a uh, 14-year-old boy on earth, who he absolutely wanted in heaven. <clears throat> the boy's father wouldn't give him up. So what Zeus ended up doing was bargaining with the dad. He gave him land animals and all sorts of things. The boy ended up going to heaven. While in heaven, he's had this water pitcher, and he would feed the gods something called ambrosia, which was the nectar of the gods. It's what the gods drank. One day he got fed up with doing that. He went to the side of heaven, just like in this picture, and he poured it out onto earth, causing a flood. That's where the Greeks get their flood story from. Zeus, who is erratic and very sexual and very, um, very difficult, um, had a problem with this, and he was going to punish the boy. But in a rare moment for Zeus of self-reflection, he realized he kind of bullied the boy up into heaven. So instead of punishing him, he just immortalized him as the constellation Aquarius. So here are the key words. You have son of man and man because Aquarius is the sign of the man, whereas Virgo is the sign of the woman. Baptism, because this is how you baptize someone. Water pitcher, because there's a water pitcher in it. Fountain, stream, river, pond, lake, ocean, sea. Water bodies, because there's water in the picture, can be used to speak about Aquarius. Now, in astrology, for those of you who know, Aquarius is actually an air sign. It's not a water sign. However, because there's water in the picture, the ancients encoded the Bible with water as Aquarius. Now, Pisces is the sign of the two fish in the water. Pisces is a mutable sign. They're a water sign. So stream, river, pond, lake, sea, ocean, all the water bodies are Pisces. So what you'll know is the first two are water. And the way that you can differentiate between which sign they're talking about is the patterns they make in the sky, which I'll show you. Now, Aries is the ram. And in Aries, you have March 21st, which is the spring equinox. It's a 12-hour day and a 12-hour night. There's also three Passovers that happen in Aries. The first Passover is, is the astrotheological one, when the sun passes over the equator and starts its way back on to its height in the summer solstice. In Christianity, the Passover is changed, and it's called the resurrection of God's son, S-U-N. God's son, S-O-N, is resurrected during Easter. This is the story that we get it from. And the Jewish Passover is when the angel of death passes over all the houses. And anyone that doesn't have the ram or the lamb, Aries the ram, doesn't have the ram's blood smeared on their doorposts, their firstborn sons get killed. So there's three Passovers that take place in Aries. Now, whenever you hear ram, lamb, shepherd, or ram's horn, you're talking about Aries. Then Taurus is the bull. And when you look at the sky and you see Taurus during the season where it's supposed to be, you know you need to put the plow on the bull so that you can plant the seeds so you can harvest in Virgo and Libra. So whenever you hear bull, ox, calf, or cow, cow being the female bull, you're talking about Taurus. Then Gemini is the twins. It's the story of Castor and Pollux Troy, whose sister was Helen of Troy. It's the story of Achilles. This is another Greek story. Whenever you hear twins or brothers, you're talking about Gemini. Then Cancer is the crab, and it's the sideways moving creature. So we don't move. We don't move like this. We don't shuffle from side to side unless we're doing a sports trip. We walk front to back or diagonally. That's it. However, the crab walks side to side, and that's important because the sun does that in Cancer. See, starting on December 25th, the sun rises a degree on its axis. The next day, an additional degree. The next day, an additional degree. And it keeps doing this every single day till it hits June 21st. When it hits June 21st, that's the summer solstice. It's the longest day of the year, the shortest night of the year. Then what it does on the 22nd is it doesn't rise an additional degree or lower a degree, but it stays at that height. In fact, it stays at that height for three days, hence walking sideways. Where then on June 25th, it lowers a degree, and then the 26th, it lowers an additional degree. Now the nights are getting longer, the days are getting shorter. Okay, And when it hits December 21st, the last day of Sagittarius, that's the winter solstice, where it then walks sideways for three more days, and then comes back to life December 25th. So whenever you hear crab or beetle, and the reason beetle is because the crab in ancient Egyptian time was known as the scarab. You even get the word crab from scarab. So crab or beetle, that's cancer. Then Leo is the king. He's the lion. He's the king of the jungle the rule, or the savannah, whatever you want to call it. The ruling planet of Leo is actually the sun. So whenever you're talking about lion, lioness, or cub, 
you're talking about Leo. Then Virgo is the woman holding the wheat stalk. Remember before when we said you plant in Taurus? Well, the virgins would cultivate the wheat in Virgo in order to make the bread for the year. So whenever you hear virgin, wheat, grain, seed, barley, corn, woman, you're talking about Virgo. The Libra is the justice. It's the scales. It's the balance. It's the just one. The reason it's the justice is because it judges God's son as it passes over the fall equinox and begins its descent into winter, into cold, into death. The Jews always celebrate the new year around the fall equinox, and eight days after the Jewish new year, they celebrate a day called Yom Kippur, which is the day of judgment. Well, of course the day of judgment happens in Libra, the judge. So Libra is also wine season, which is when you plant for the grapes in Taurus, you could press the wine here. Libra is also olive oil season. That's when you press the olives to get the oil. So whenever you hear law, judge, justice, the just one, divorce, marriage, court, wine, vineyard, wine press, grapes, olive oil or olive oil, you're talking about Libra. So all law related things, all wine related things, and all olive related things. Now, Scorpio is the betrayer. He's the scorpion. When a scorpion bites you, it leaves an imprint in your skin that looks like a pair of lips. It's why the mafia has the kiss of death. And it's why Jesus was betrayed by Judas with a kiss. Each one of the disciples represents one of the zodiac signs. We'll get into that. The sun is judged in Libra, remember, with the scales. And it's betrayed in Scorpio. Finally, in Sagittarius, this is where the bow and the arrow shoot the sun and inflict further punishment on the sun. This is where the sun dies. Why? Because on December 21st, the last day of Sagittarius, the sun is at its lowest point. It cannot rise any lower. It was dead. The ancients used to look out into the horizon, and they would notice the sun didn't rise above the horizon on December 21st. So they would say God's sun was dead. For, was dead. Then it walks sideways like the crab in Cancer for three days, so suddenly God's sun was dead for three days. When on December 25th, or the birth of God's sun, it rises another degree and starts to make its way up to the top. So whenever you hear horse, bow and arrow, spear, or horseman, you're talking about Sagittarius. Then finally is Capricorn the goat. Now, if you look at the zodiac wheel on the right, Capricorn's at the very bottom. Okay? And the goat climbs the mountain better than any animal on like a two-inch ledge. I don't know if you've ever seen it, Derek. You ever see a goat actually climb a mountain before? Yes. You have? Yes. It's absurd. It's absurd. They're on like a... a, a They're like... A, a, like on death's edge 24 7 it's ridiculous it's, it, yes so the goat climbs the mountain just like the sun starts to climb the great mountain for the great year starting in capricorn and those are the 12 signs so have you heard them explain that way before before i move on i know but i i definitely have heard the crab stuff and the things that you're describing uh on those things but i haven't heard that in particular okay <clears throat> now there's some names that are given to Jesus in church or for Jesus in church that are all astrological based and the church goers have no idea. And they keep using these names over and over again. Let's go over them. Remember, Jesus is the sun. I'm making the argument he's the sun in the sky. When the sun is in Capricorn, the goat, his name is the scapegoat of Israel. When the sun is in the sign of the man, Aquarius, he's the son of man. When the sun is in Pisces, the two fish, he's known as the fisherman of men. And it's also why he feeds the masses with two fish. When the sun is in Aries, the ram, he's called the lamb of God or the good shepherd. In Gemini, the twins, Jesus had a brother, James, but he also had a twin, Thomas. Now, Thomas, To'am in Hebrew, it was Thomas Didymus. To'am in Hebrew means twin. Whereas Didymus in Greek means twin. Remember, the Greeks and the Jews were, were, very, were influencing each other at the time. Now, when the sun is in Cancer, the scarab, the beetle, St. Augustine called Jesus the good beetle. When the sun is in Leo, the lion, he is called the lion of Judah. When the sun is in Virgo, the lady holding the stalk of wheat, he is born of a virgin and he's called the bread of life. When the sun is in Libra, the scales of justice, he is known as the just one. Then he's betrayed in Scorpio. 
He dies in Sagittarius on December 21st, and it's why he's worshipped on the Sun Day. Now, if you look at this picture of Jesus that I have here, it's a stereotypical one that I ripped off the internet. Honestly, I could change it. It's interchangeable. But I'm going to draw your attention to a couple of things. You're going to see the sun behind his head. You're going to see that white face, that stereotypical face that we've come to understand Jesus as. The two fingers up like this. The heart and the crown of thorns wrapped around it outside the body. Heart's always outside the body. It's very interesting. And the white and the red robe. So let me explain the white and the red robe. Do you remember at the beginning how I told you the book is also an alchemy book? Well, the white and the red is a marriage in alchemy. Okay, It's the marriage of the red king and the white queen. It's just a fancy way of talking about mixing sulfur and mercury. That's why he wears the red and the white always. Okay, Now, the sun is always behind Jesus because he represents the sun. Find a picture of Jesus on the internet where the sun is not behind his head. Now, the two fingers up like this are an ancient comedic peace sign. Now, this that I'm doing right now that you're seeing, this V, this is Churchill's V for victory. It's a war sign. It's a British war sign. This is the ancient peace sign. So when you see Jesus doing this, or you see Buddha doing this, or you see Vishnu, or you even see Baphomet doing this, they're telling you they're peaceful. Now, the white Jesus face, the picture, is actually a guy named Caesar Borgia, who is the bastard son of Rodrigo Borgia, Pope Alexander VI. See, Rodrigo Borgia is part of the, um, the 13 Illuminati families, and he bought his way to the papacy. And what happened was the printing press came out about 80 years before he ascended. So what they did was he mass produced his son's face, and his son was a bastard in life and in general. In life, because popes never got married, so all their kids were bastards. But Caesar Borgia also killed his brother and slept with his sister. He was an awful person, but he is the face that is made of Jesus. Now, the crown of thorns wrapped around the heart on the outside of the body, and the heart is always on the outside, represents the rays of the sun. The heart outside the body represents the human toroidal field. These are four pictures of Jesus I pulled from the internet. Honestly, I could have done a thousand pictures. You'll see the sun, the sun, the sun, the sun. The same face. In the second from left, you'll see a Knights Templar cross in the sun. The two fingers up, the two fingers up. You'll see the heart and the crown of thorns outside the body. Now, even in baby Jesus pictures, look at this. You'll see the North Star right there, always shining bright. You'll see the Son uh, of God, Jesus, with the sun behind his head in every picture. Now, the toroidal field I was talking to you about is an electromagnetic field of the heart, okay? It, it, this is what it looks like, basically. You're the core of the apple, and it extends around you six feet. They know this. They can measure it. Some people call it an aura. There's definitely fo there's photography that you can measure this. With. It's a six-foot electrochemical or electromagnetic field of the heart. The reason they tried to keep you six feet apart in this pandemic, not to go into a conspiracy theory, is because they wanted to keep you isolated. Because they knew, Derek, when someone comes up behind you and you know they're there, even if they're a few feet away or they weren't making any noise, they broke your toroidal field. You're not a psychic. When you interact with someone, it looks like this. It even forms a vesica Pisces in the middle. This is what two toroidal fields interacting look like. Now, the guy on the left is the picture of Jesus. And the guy on the right is the early picture of Caesar Borgia. Can you kind of see where he gets his facial features from? Well, I can definitely, if I'm trying to compare the two, I can definitely see similarities. Yes. But I, I connecting those, that's that's something we'd probably have to like dive into much more material to try and find right. some genealogical well, connection. Because I'm ex like I said, man, I'm extremely skeptical. You know what I mean on on yeah. a lot of this stuff. So. That's fine. I just wanted you to admit that you see similarities. That's all I was looking for. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it, to be fair, right, I could go get 10 other pictures of 10 other people and then go, I think there's similarities between, you know, True. you know what I mean? There has been some deep studies into this. Honestly, comparing Caesar Borgia to Jesus isn't my fight. I'm an astrotheologist, but I just wanted to show this picture to everyone. You guys can make up your own minds or look, decide to look into it deeper if you wanted. Now, before the Shroud of Turin was discovered in 525 AD, almost all paintings and drawings of Jesus were shown as a young, beardless man. So now let's use the cipher that I came up with 
to start decoding passages. In Micah 5.2, my namesake, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. However, Bethlehem is not a place. It's a two-word combination in Hebrew. Bet means house, and Lechem means bread. So the house of bread. Well, I told you each zodiac sign was called a house. Who is the house of bread? It's Virgo, the lady with the wheat stalk. So astrotheologically, this passage is telling you that the Savior will come from a virgin. Does that make sense? I definitely get your interpretation of it, and I understand okay. what you're what you're doing. I definitely, I don't want to sidetrack from the discussion, but I, I geographically, you know, I I would say there's definitely a place of Bethlehem, but. I understand. No, no, no. That I know there is a place called Bethlehem. I yeah, know but that. I understand that, like, you're you're pulling from the etymology here to try and say, like, hey, hold on, they're they have an astrological significance right. to naming this as well. So, right. So I'm going to read you Deuteronomy 32. He gave them honey from the cliffs and olive oil from the rocky ground. He gave his people butter from the herd and milk from the flock. He gave them lambs and goats. They had the best rams from Bashan and the finest wheat. They drank the best wine made from the juice of red grapes. But Jeshurun became fat and kicked like a bull. So let's use the cipher. First, he gave them honey from the cliffs. Now, in the sign Cancer, there's a group of stars called the Beehive Cluster. So that's where the honey comes from. It's, it's an asterism. It's a closely knit group of stars like the Pleiades Seven Sisters are. So he gave them honey from the cliffs. So the honey is Cancer. And olive oil, we know olive oil is Libra. That's when it's harvested. He gave his people butter from the herd and milk from the flock. Well, the milk comes from the Milky Way galaxy, who's been called the Milky Way galaxy as far back as the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The middle of the Milky Way galaxy is in Sagittarius. So you have the honey in Cancer and the milk in Sagittarius. That half of the zodiac, the right half of the zodiac, is your land of milk and honey. It's not a place on Earth. It's a place in the heavens. He gave them lambs, that's Aries, and goats, the goat is Capricorn. They had the best rams, that's Aries, from Bashan and the finest wheat, lady with the wheat stalk, Virgo. They drank the best wine made from the juice of red grapes, that's Libra, that's when you press the wine. But Jeshurun became fat and kicked like a bull, that's Taurus. Now if you look at this, the Mount of Olives, Jesus led his disciples to the Mount of Olives after his last Passover. So he could teach them a few more things, pray, then wait for Judas to betray him. While walking to the Mount of Olives, he gave the parable of the true vine. So look at the zodiac wheel on the left. So after Passover, Passover takes place in Aries, which is all the way on the left. Well, right after that, he walks to the Mount of Olives. Well, I told you olives are Libra. How do you get from Aries to Libra on the wheel? You go across. They're cross signs. They're opposing signs. You will notice that the patterns I'm going to show you today they're always going to be talking about their neighboring signs, which are the two signs that hug it, and their opposing signs. It's always going to make those patterns. So Passover is in Aries. He walks to the Mount of Olives. That's Libra. While in Libra, they're waiting for Judas to betray him. Well, I told you the betrayer happens in Scorpio. The scorpion is the betrayer. So you go from Aries to Libra, and then you're waiting for the next sign over. So right now you have a cross pattern and a next pattern. And while he's in Libra, he gave the parable of the true vine, which goes back to grapes, which goes back to the vine, which goes back to Libra again. Do you see how you can start to figure this out using the Zodiac? Because that's basically what I'm going to be showing you. I definitely see what you're doing. And I think so. I even created a poll just to get everyone's opinion in the chat on what they think about astrotheology and whether or not they think it explains everything. And I definitely can. I see personally when I read, I do think that there is astrology in the theological sense, you know, built into some of the stuff we're finding biblically. I'm, and this is what I was telling you before the show, like the interactions, right? When you ask me, I definitely see what you're saying. If that's what you're asking me, I'm very cautious about using this as an interpretation for everything. Okay. Like everything becomes the model by which we should try to see astrotheology. Well, hold on a second, because I did tell you that the Bible is made up of 10 holy sciences, and I only teach one of them. So I'm just showing you one of them. Right. I'm just making the point that, like, for example, Deuteronomy 32 is known for poetry. It's like a well-known poetic uh, passage. 
And when you read it, you could see even in other passages, the one that you brought up, for example, um, I would just carefully be looking at this and saying, okay, as we said before the show, you know, I think there's some astro theology there for sure. I just don't know about using this as a tool for everything. And I imagine using that kind of methodology, right? Even the, even the Zodiac, because we know they use the Zodiac. When I go and let's say I open up any ancient text, whether it's biblical, whether it's a holy book, whether it's maybe I open up an ancient historian text. If I grab certain things that you're using some of these tools, these tools to try and understand, I, I could kind of come up with an interpretation where it sounds like astro theology. Well, he mentioned a river or he mentioned a, you know, a lake or, or whatever, when we're, we're talking about Aquarius or whatever it might be that methodology by which we're trying to interpret. And this is the difficult problem I've tried to explain to Christians as we've discussed this with them for so long here on myth vision is interpretation is like, it's like a rubber band. It stretches, you can do anything with it. And if we don't have good methodology to ground it, you know, that's, that's one of my concerns. It's like, are we going too far? This is my, just my thought process as we're going, but I get what you're saying because if I was an ancient Israelite, who's worshiping and I'm thinking of a Zodiac. Am I, am I tracking my world like this? Maybe, you know, maybe there is this, this process. I don't know if the common Israelite in the world would know this. Maybe the priest would know some of this stuff, but I, anyway, this is just me voicing my opinion. Since you asked me to jump in and like give my thoughts and I'm, I'm just throwing yeah. it out there and I'm writing questions along the way. So at the end, I can have that conversation with you and then give you my thoughts, right? So everybody can make up their own mind on where they're at. And of course, mm -hmm. since I'm speaking, feel free to super chat questions or comments, whether you agree, disagree, whatever you'd like to highlight. Of course, that helps support us here in MythVision. But um, anyway, this is just me throwing it out there. But I do track what you're saying and following the houses, understanding that these people are, are seeing it that way. You know what I mean? Okay, great. Wonderful. Cool. Okay. So we're not so, like completely in disagreement here, but I'm no, I also, you know, cautious about a lot of the things, if that makes sense. Right. Well, I'm going to use this methodology to just show you how prevalent it is. I'll just, I'll explain it that way. So Genesis 1, 7, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. So the firmament, you see this dividing line between the zodiac signs that doesn't actually exist. What it is, is called, some people call them cusp. Some people call them handover dates. What it is is three days in each sign. Three days in Aquarius, hands over to three days in Pisces. Those are the cusps. The firmament are the dividing lines. The firmament is not the dome over a flat earth. That's not what it is. And I'm going to show you other verses with this. So the firmament is the dividing line between zodiac signs. Now, the two water signs, Aquarius and Pisces, so, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which are under the firmament, so that's Pisces, from the waters which are above the firmament, and it was so. Now, you're absolutely right. There's a hundred different ways you could take this. I'm just showing you one way. So, Revelation 4, 7. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like a man. I'm sorry, the second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. This is in Revelation. We get astrotheology in Revelation 2. So the first living creature was like a lion. That's Leo. The second was like an ox. That's Taurus. The third had a face like a man. That's Aquarius. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Now, in astrology, the Scorpio scorpion is the belly crawling creature. It's the lowest form of life on Earth. Having to crawl on your belly, slither, is a, is a punishment. That's why the first thing in the Garden of Eden, after the deception, God takes away the legs of the snake. In fact... In Santa de la Muerte, in Mexico, people dress up in suits on the holiday, and they crawl on their bellies in suits to church. It's a form of punishment. It's a humbling experience. The evolved form, also known as the ascendant of the scorpion, is the eagle, which is the highest flying form of life on Earth. So the eagle, and it evolves one more time from the eagle and becomes the phoenix. So the eagle is actually the scorpio as well. So Leo Taurus... Aquarius and Scorpio are the four fixed signs of the Zodiac. You have what's known as fixed signs. You have cardinal signs, fixed signs, and mutable signs in astrology. You have um, three signs in each season. 
The first sign in the season is the cardinal sign. That's why churches have cardinals. The sign can be broken down into three 10-day segments called deacons. That's why church has, car has deacons, cardinals and deacons. Um, the second sign is the fixed sign because it's fixed in their season. Leo is in the middle of summer, Taurus spring, Aquarius winter, and the eagle or Scorpio is in the fall. So these are the four fixed signs of the zodiac. Now it goes even further than that because the man Aquarius and the lion Leo are opposing signs. The ox Taurus and the eagle Scorpion are opposing signs. So when you read this, the first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. There's either a four-headed, it's called the tetramorph, that's going to be in the heavens, or they're literally just talking about this zodiac pattern right here, where it makes a cross because of the opposing signs. Now, if we go into Ezekiel 10:14, each of the cherubim had four faces. One face was that of a cherub the second the face of a human being, the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. It's the same thing. Now, Revelation 12, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. So, a woman clothed with the sun is the sun clothed in Virgo. It's just a metaphor for the sun being in Virgo. Now, if the sun's in Virgo, the moon will be at her feet. So, there's 12 zodiac signs and a 24-hour-a-day clock. So, the sun spends two hours a day in each sign. If the sun is in Virgo in the day, that's between 4 and 6 p.m. The sun is still out. So, if the sun is out, the moon is metaphorically at her feet. These are just metaphors. Um, whereas if the moon is up, the sun is at her feet. Now another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous dragon. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. The constellation Draco is the dragon. Its tail goes from Aries to Sagittarius, which is four twelfths of the signs, or one third of the stars out of the sky. Now if we talk about Revelation 7.4, then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. This is used by Christians to mention the fact that, and especially Jehovah's Witnesses, to mention the fact that 144,000 people get to go to heaven and that's it. But that's not what they're talking about. There's influences from the outside too. This are, there are seven chakras. The root has four petals. The sacral has six. The solar plexus has ten. The heart has 12 and the throat has 16, which equals 48. The third eye chakra is represented by 96 and only has two petals because it's two times as powerful as the lower chakras. So 48 times 2 is 96. The crown chakra is a thousand times more powerful than the lower six chakras. When you add the lower six, you get 96 plus 48 equals 144. When you times that by a thousand, you get your 144,000. When you've activated all your chakras, that is when you get to go see God. That is when you go to heaven. These are influenced by the East as well. Matthew 10:16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. For the sheep is Aries, and the wolf is the constellation Lupus, who borders the Libra line. Look at the pattern it makes. They're opposing signs. You're always going to see the opposing signs or the neighboring signs. I can understand... If you were skeptical, if you were talking about, let's say, Gemini, so you were talking about the twins and the fish, because they don't make any patterns in the, in the zodiac. But all these patterns I'm showing you are either opposing signs or neighboring signs. They're very deliberate. So I've given examples of astrotheology in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. I've been accused of cherry-picking verses from the Bible to prove a point. So let's take a much longer passage and see if we can decode it as well. So I get to the story of Job. So Job was basically, he was a righteous man who had everything. He had land, he had money, he had family, he had animals. And Satan went up to God and said, the only reason he's so faithful to you is because he has everything. You take it away, he'll, he'll lose it. And God said, I'll take the bet. I don't believe that'll happen. Um, he says, I'll take the bet. Um, you could do whatever you want to him, but you can't take his life. So little by little, 
Job starts losing everything. And at one point, I believe he has boils um, and he is sitting on a rock and he's calling out to God. What I'm going to read to you is God's reply to him. Whereas the first sentence is going to be what God says. The second sentence is going to be the astrological decoding. So Job 38, 32, the first thing he says is, can you lead forth the Maseroth? The Maseroth literally means the Zodiac. Okay, you could trace the etymology for that word. But Maseroth literally means Zodiac. The first thing he asks is, do you know your Zodiac? Maseroth over time becomes Mazalot, which survives in Judaism today as Mazel Tov, which is good fortune from the stars. So what is the Lord's challenge to Job? The first two are blatantly star poetry. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Well, those are obvious. Then the next is, can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? The constellations are the zodiac above. The bear and its cubs are Ursa Major, the great bear, and Ursa Minor, part of the Big Dipper. Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens? Well, that's literally a man with a water pitcher. That's Aquarius, tipping it over. Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions? That's Leo. <clears throat> Who provides food for the raven? That's the constellation Corvus, which means raven, and was bordering on Virgo. Do you watch where the doe bears her fawn? Mariga, meaning deer, is located in Orion, which is between uh, Taurus and Gemini. Who let the wild donkey go free? That's a Celis borealis, meaning donkey, and is located in Cancer. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? That's Taurus. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully. Lambda Achille or Al Thaliman, which means two ostriches in Arabic. I don't know why this came off like this. Does the, do you give the horse its strength? It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. It does not shy away from the sword, the quiver. So there we know it's a horse, and the quiver is what holds the arrows next to the horse, it's Sagittarius with the bow and the arrow. Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? That's Aquila which is the Latin name for eagle and is a constellation a few degrees above the celestial equator. Finally, he says, can you pull on Leviathan with a fish hook? And at the time, there were competing fish gods um, that were going on. You had Dagonism, you had Mithraism, Leviathan was an ancient fish god, and the fish are Pisces. So as you see here in Job 38, 32, he first asks him, do you know your zodiac? And then he proceeds to quiz him on it. That's all he does. That's his entire reply. And if you notice, I've been jumping from book to book to book throughout the Old Testament, the New Testament, Revelation, Genesis. I've been doing everything to show you that these codes are in all of them. If you go to the book of Psalms 104, he sends forth springs in their valleys. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and wine, which makes man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil. The high mountains are for the wild goats. He made the moon for the seasons. The sun knows the place of its setting. The young lions were after their prey. The springs are Aquarius. The wild donkeys are Arcellus borealis, which are in Cancer. The cattle is Taurus the bull. The wine is Libra. The oil is Libra. The wild goats are Capricorn. The moon for the seasons and the sun knows the place of its setting is openly talking about the sun and the moon. The lions who are after their prey are Leo. So that's Psalms. So answers to the questions at the beginning. Hold on a sec. How Jesus was able to heal the blind. The story in the Bible, the man comes up, the blind man comes up to Jesus. Jesus licks his fingers and touches his eyes and he can see. However, Jesus, the son, S-U-N, does the same exact thing. Right now it's getting dark outside, so I've lost my sight. I can't see anything when I look outside. However, when the sun comes up and touches my eyes, I'm given the gift of sight. It heals the blind. How he walked on water. The story is Jesus walked on water. Well, the sun does the same thing, too. If you've ever been on a, a, a fishing boat and you see the sun walk alongside the ocean as it sets. Now, Jesus was known as Christ. Christ is a title. It's not a name. In Greek, because we were talking about the Greeks before, Christos means oil. Well, the oil, any oil, walks on water as well. So you have the double entendre. How he turned water into wine, this is a, not a parlor trick. This is part of the, uh, the sky clock that I'm talking about. The reason God is considered a man and Mother Earth is considered a woman has to do with one thing only, 
and that has to do with the sacred fluid that comes down from the heavens, God's rain. In Hebrew, it's called shemen. We get the word semen from it. So what happens is, in Taurus, as above, so below, you look at the sky, you see the bull, you have to put the plow on the bull to plant, and then you plant the grapes, or you plant the seeds, and then it rains, and it rains, and it rains. And then what happens is, in Libra, you pick the grapes and you make it into wine. That's how you turn God's water into wine. Why he had 12 disciples, why he was betrayed by, why he had 12 disciples, for example, we went over that. Um, Judas would be Scorpio. I mean, John the Baptist, the man with the water pitcher baptizing people would be Aquarius. Uh, Thomas Didymus, we went over that, the twins in Gemini. There's a story for all of them. Why he was betrayed with a kiss by Judas, we went over that. Why he was dead for three days, we went over that. Why is his birthday on December 25th, we went over that. Now, this science only works for people in the Northern Hemisphere, and there is a reason for that. The Egyptians, Jews, Christians, and Muslims are all based out of the Northern Hemisphere. For example, June 21st, the summer solstice is actually the winter solstice in Australia and New Zealand, much of South Africa and South America. See, if these ancient holy texts had come from the South, it would be in reverse. So it doesn't stop there. It's not just random passages in the Bible that can be decoded this way. We're going to go through the entire book of Matthew to show how deep this runs. So do we have any super chats or anything before I get into this? I want to kind of know where everybody's thinking right now. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's a lot of back and forth there. I think most of our audience thinks there can be definite, you know, evidence of astrotheology, biblically speaking. If you take the Israelites as people who were in captivity in Babylon, we know in Babylon, they had these things you know, they had an astrological sense of heavens and uh, calendars and such that might have impacted Jewish literature. Um, but a lot of people are skeptical of certain details and some of the things that you might be mentioning, they're not, you know, agreeing with on those. But we do have a few super chats. Um, M. Doug says, do you think that the editors of the Bible adjusted stories to fit with the similar Greek motifs? It's a very interesting question. Um, what I'm trying to show right now is I'm talking about the sun going through the 12 signs of the zodiac in what's known as Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, the sun going through it. And from what I gather, it's the same thing throughout every single culture, throughout time, throughout every single culture. And I have used this cipher that I've already given you guys a taste of. I've used this to decode all these ancient texts with astrotheology to show these patterns, to show this. And I firmly believe that it's always been sun worship. See, what happened with the, with the Greeks and everybody else is basically they looked at the heavens and they saw this craziness going on in, in the heavens. They saw shooting stars. They saw planets doing this. They saw this. And what they did was they tell their kids stories about it. This is how it started in Sumer, by the way. They would tell their kids stories about it, and then they would tell their kids stories. It got passed down, then eventually they figured out how to write on clay tablets and things of that nature. It got written down, and then eventually it got passed down, and then eventually every every new zodiac sign, it got updated, and the whole mythology completely changed. But there's a common thread. The universe has a way of being very orderly. The universe has a way of being very orderly. Things end up making sense. You just have to find it. If it's too complicated for you, if if explaining something is too complicated or you need to use 50 different million things to to describe something, then it's usually not the right answer. Things tend to be the, – there tends to be a unifying answer to everything. Okay, so so just on M. Doug's note, I think he specifically was asking you – I don't know if I'd word it that way, but do I think that Greek literature, let's put it that way, in the Greek mythology influenced biblical stories? I would say yes, in some way, depending on the text, depending on the story. Um, but this is, you know, one thing that in, look, I really, really like you. You know that. We've talked. I mean, I may not agree with some of the conclusions, but I hope that people will be respectful because some people in the chat are annoyed or not agreeing and stuff and that's fine you don't have to some of them are like no astro theology is true and right but he's not representing it right or he's not presenting it right or whatever um this is stuff that i'm seeing in the chat 
at the end of the day, this is something that I find interesting in light of this discussion is that you can interpretations, you can almost make any interpretation about some of these things. And this is just one example because Christians will go and you ask them, Hey, what's this mean? And they'll find a way to make things make sense. For example, um, I, I have a, uh, one that you mentioned equating the 144,000 with chakras, right? Right. Well, the way I understood this, right. When I was reading this is in the end, you've got a new creation. The new Testament keeps talking about a new creation coming on the book of revelation mentions new Jerusalem, new heavens, and these, Israelite warriors that are coming, 12,000 from each tribe, because there's 12 tribes, and the list of the tribes aren't the same as some of the lists that you see in the Old Testament. But the chakras thing, I don't, I wouldn't insert that. Could it be? I guess, you know, I just personally wouldn't jump to that conclusion because I could probably find something else that might be 144,000. And to give you an example, um, if you do six days, man is created on the sixth day. There's 24 hours in a day. 24 times six is 144. And you wonder, okay, is this kind of a time thing? Along with what you're talking about, calendar, time, we're talking about time. Well, on the sixth day, man is created. Is this a representation of the new man, right? New creation. And so I just wouldn't jump the chakras. And I think that that's a leap, right? For me, I'm like, I unless I had early interpretive like people were telling me in early literature this is how they were reading this material i personally would be cautious before jumping to those kind of conclusions if i found historical precedents for an interpretation like that which is something i think we'll get to at the end of this that's when i would go okay hold up um there were people who actually understood this that way and that would be a good methodology i would think the problem is, is if we say well people understood it that way but they didn't write it it's unfalsifiable in many ways to try and prove that that's how people understood this literature, if that makes sense. And I'm looking for falsifiable information to try and go, oh, oh, can I can I test it? Can I observe that this is how people understood this? Um, but a lot of the things, there are things that jump out at me and I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you brought up Job. I'm like, yeah, okay. This is, um, this is definitely talking about astrology. When was Job written? Where? These are questions I have, right? And I'd like to dive into. Um but I'm also very careful about how far I would use that, the tool that you're bringing to the table to describe all of this. You, you get what I'm saying? Like, I would be very cautious. Um, we do have more Super Chats, but I just want to throw that out there. And at the end, I'm just putting more questions together. We'll go over some of those things and talk about the differences here. Paul Kickling, Androgynous Adam, Aries, Torn, Taurus, into two genders, Gemini. Cancer is eating the fruit, then they have sex. Leo Virgo, like Milton's paradise, loss. lost. So I don't know if you are familiar with this. I'm sure you've heard of Milton's paradise, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that super chat? You Do you agree with that conclusion about Adam and Eve or? I don't really, I don't really see things that way, to be honest. But okay, this is good. So this is a good example. Paul Kickling is looking, and I have another friend who thinks that it's literally sun worship all the way through the Bible, starting with Adam all the way to the end. In well, fact, I, I kind of lean towards that. Yeah, I'm just saying that you you can make interpretations, and that's the problem with interpretations. Is like we can all come to the table with one, and like it, it could sound and make sense in our heads, but it's like, how do we anchor it? to knowing exactly what is being said is the hard part. That's, that's the hard part. Okay. Paul, thank you so much for that, man. Really appreciate that. Imnag says, I believe astrology has been greatly overlooked when it comes to the Bible and it deserves a much more serious look into no, or sorry, look serious. Look, it's no coincidence. There's a lot of astrology scattered all over the Bible. I agree. I think you agree as well. <laughs> Tunnels, can you explain the resurrection symbolism with astrology, meaning crux and the sign and the sun? I imagine you're going to get into that, right? I'm trying to think if I do get into it as far as this. I um, the pretty much where the it, uh, the cross in the sky, the celestial symbol. I don't know if you go into that. I know that that was on some 
that's been an astrotheology explanation. Even Robert Price at one point, when I asked him, I said, hey, what do you think the, the crucifixion means? He took an approach that Richard Carrier did not on trying to explain this in some way. Uh, he said that maybe it's the, I don't know, you talk about equinox and whatnot going on in the heavens. So I'm not familiar. What, do you take that interpretation? I just, I kind of see it like um, basically the way that I described the 12 signs is that um, December 25th is his birthday because the sun comes back to life. That's why all the ancient gods are born. Ancient sun gods are the ancient gods are born on December 25th. They're all dead for three days prior to because of the sun, because it, it stays at that low point and it doesn't rise or lower. It just stays there for three days. Um, it's just it's, it's it's basically what I had explained before. That's that's kind of the way I see it. OK, so tunnels, I hope that answers your question. I think tunnels is in favor of astrotheology. Constellation Pegasus in the house. Thank you. Anyone here of the book Sacred Knowledge of the Essenes? Primitive Christians saw a video on how the Zodiac played a big part in early Christianity. I am, and don't take it the wrong way, Micah. I literally do believe that they have obviously a calendar, a sacred uh, calendar in mind, especially when you look at the floors of a lot of these uh, synagogues and such. The timekeeping in Enoch, Enoch's very solar in their calendar keeping rather than lunar. Um, so there's 100%, nobody should walk away from this and think there's nothing to it. And when I'm critical, it's not me being rude. I promise you, I'm literally simply pointing out right. that I want to anchor this stuff with solid data so that we, we, we're hearing an interpretation and I'm asking our audience as we said up front, right? We told them like, you can think something stronger or not disagree. That's cool. Um, I'm looking for something to solidly anchor astro theology to it. And that I just haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't read this book. Let's just put it that way. So I hope more people will consider, you know, taking a serious look, even if you don't agree with some of the things that Mike is saying, because there is some validity to calendar keeping, solar astronomy. And, and one of the uh, accusations I've heard early on when I got into this was no, they only worship God. God is not a son, right? It, he is the God of the sun. He creates the sun in Genesis. So there's no way they would be that into astro theology. I'm sure you've heard this, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, no, nah. actually, you know, they still had calendar keeping. And of course, while they worshiped one God, there were many gods. They recognized this. And, um, thank you. I haven't read that book, uh, constellation, but I haven't heard. Let me see. Sacred knowledge of the Essenes. No, I haven't heard of it. Have you? No. No. Um, Marg's in the house says, would you say all religions use astro theology, but they have different stories? Any comments? Good question. Thank you. The, the stories are different. The, right. the, 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 the These are Jungian archetypes. These are archetypes that are in the stories. That's what they are. They're archetypes. They're not real people. Their stories like I, I explain it like this like you wouldn't read the odyssey or the iliad and think these are real people or beowulf for example you wouldn't read that and think it's a literal thing that happened but something happened along the way that people take the bible literally and that's not the case at all when it when it goes back to the other ancient um the stories change the the holy stories that they follow change but it's just a different way of talking about the sun going through the zodiac and the 12 zodiac signs and through the hero's journey where it will then be uh, judged, betrayed, killed, and resurrected, just like the sun. Let me That's ask you this. You yeah. got me thinking here because I've been picking up the Odyssey and the Iliad a little more. And I'm not so sure that the Greeks would have thought this didn't happen at all, right? Common folks would have probably believed it's literally true. Um, some of the philosophers might have said, well, we don't think this literally happened in so many respects, but the author's intending to tell you a story about a war that happened in ancient Troy and Greeks are involved in this I battle. I think we're missing the bigger question here. I think we're missing the entirely bigger question here. The bigger question is here is it's not that these are encoded because whether you agree with my decodings or not, honestly, right. you know, I'm still going to teach what I do and – 
you know, it's not for everyone. Honestly, I'm not offended if you guys don't like it or if some of right. you don't like it. Well, some do, some don't. Please don't get disappointed. I want you know. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Um, when you do bigger shows, you have more white, more more weighing uh, opinions. Right. I'm I'm fine with it. I'm not upset. I, I I my point is I think we're missing the bigger question. The bigger question is not what do these people think of these stories. The bigger question is this: we can all at least agree that these are encoded in some way. The question is, why does every ancient tribe feel the need to not just come out and say what they're saying? They feel the need to deeply encode things. Yeah. I wonder if there's an art in the authors. There's an art right. in their in their literature in which they express the sacredness of the heavens in their in their writing of things here. Because I, I feel like what we should do rather than completely encoding right on some of those things is to try and incorporate um how the historical setting, not saying the things literally happen that are described, but there is a historical setting. For example, Philistines. We talked about Samson. I am a hook, line, and well, sinker. we talk about Samson. Samson in Hebrew is Shimshon, which means little son. Right. Whereas Delilah in Hebrew, the root of Delilah is Lila, which means night. And what does she do? She cuts his hair. He gouges his out. It's a right. metaphorical story of the sun being overtaken by the night. I agree, by the way. This is like a 100%. I think you and me are in total agreement here. And they're incorporating things that are relevant to people here on earth and stuff in a coded way. Do you understand why the cutting of the hair is significant? The rays of the sun, the power of the sun are being cut, right? No, there's nothing to do with the rays of the sun. When you think of, when you when they talk about the ancient uh, Indians, right, that lived on earth before they were forced to join the military, they used to have long hair. Mm -hmm. And they used to tell people that having a long hair was like having a sixth sense. They could hear people coming up behind them. It gave them extrasensory powers that when they cut their hair for the military to start fighting, they lost it. So the ancients must have known this because having long hair it, in the Bible, they talk about it in another place. You know, this woman talks about how if God gives her this, then she will never take a razor to her man's head or to her baby's head because having long hair, they knew about these extrasensory powers. We don't give the ancients enough credit. That's another thing. We go through something called chronological ethnocentrism. And that's just a big fancy way of saying that because people are from the past, they must be dumber than us because we're in the future and we know everything. And that's bullshit. Oh, excuse my language. But um, now I hear you. It, now, the reason I said it was hair is he has seven locks. Right. The story literally describes seven locks and they have a seven week cycle. So being the small son who has his seven days cut short, so to speak, um, I'm thinking this is entering the winter solstice, which is why I'm thinking Delilah symbolically, the whole narrative is to cut the hair immediately after the hair is cut. The eyes are gouged. Out, darkness comes on him. He now is grinding mill like in the winter. You would imagine we harvest for the winter. Um, and, and then eventually his hair grows back. And then next thing you know, pillars to the Dagon temple. But I, that's why that, but notice how you disagree with the interpretation and you have a different reason for why that interpretation is something else. It's really slippery to pin down what is the real deal. You know what that's I mean? That's the fun of it. It is fun. And I hope people will exercise that more. But what it tells me is that the people who want to run around, and I think you would agree with me on this, and act like the Bible is the truth and we've got the understanding and we know what it actually is teaching and slamming it in people's faces and tell them they're going to go to a literal place called hell is just wild. I mean, it well, tells you that it's so open for interpretation. It, it's like, who has the capital T on knowing all of this? No. Well, there's a quote that I like to quote from a guy named John Dominic Croissant. I don't know if you've ever heard of him before. Yeah. I yeah. interview him all the time. <laughs> you really? Yeah. Yeah. He's got this quote that I just love, and I, I use it all the time. He says that it's not that the ancient people wrote literal stories and were now smart enough to take them symbolically, but that they wrote them symbolically and were now dumb enough to take them literally. <laughs> I've heard him. He has a Power of Parables book that actually goes into that. Great point. Great point, Micah. I really appreciate you, man. Constellation Pegasus, it takes a lot of work and mathematics to make a zodiac. Somewhere I heard mankind is not old enough and developed to make one end an astronomer to answer this possibly evidence that humans are more than 6,000 years old. 
of course we're older than that. But yeah, Constellation is. Uh, oh, I awesome. talked about it at the beginning. You can't argue the Lascaux Caves. I mean, they carbon dated it. It was 17,000 years old. It survived the previous cataclysm. All the constellations were in the exact same place that they would have been 17,000 years ago in that exact same location. We've understood astrology. In fact, it's almost as if, look, I'm just in love with it. Okay. So I just talk about it. I know that I don't have the only answer. And I'm right, right at the beginning of the podcast. Right at the beginning, I told you, I know of at least 10 holy sciences that are just as in-depth as what I do, okay? Right. So I don't go around explain, telling people that I know the truth. I, I, I know I, – I, and you know what? For what I do know, I know I don't know anything, which is, again, that's what they say intelligence is, right? It's to realize that the dumb person thinks they have it figured out and the smart person realizes that they, they, they're born knowing nothing and then they'll, they'll never end up learning anything anyway always so, always keep learning right yeah. like well that's it that's the people who have the drive and this is why this is why i told you derek before i think that the most interesting people in the world are self-taught you know you're um you're um what's it called what was that movie with uh what was that movie with matt damon and uh, ben affleck the first one they did oh you're talking about where he's like how do you like them apples uh yeah he's yeah, a yeah. janitor Right. Yeah. But he's brilliant because yeah. the most interesting people and the most intelligent people aren't going to go through academia because it's so rigid. And to I get don't know. Else, so this is something I wrote down. I think it's worth having the conversation about it. So you said uh, how much academic research. So I, I asked how much academic research. Right. And right. I understand the notion of wanting to be self-taught and learn these things. When I first got into this, I was like, OK, hold up. How come? Um. I need to, I need to look and learn. And I was learning from, uh, Freemason. Um, what is his name? 32nd degree Freemason. Might have, he might've been 33rd degree, but he was teaching astrotheology on YouTube. He's like, oh, a 19th Manly P. Hall. yeah, Manly P hall. Yeah. I loved watching his stuff, listening to him and, and other people, right. Trying to figure out what's going on biblically, very esoteric, very symbolic Jungian in many ways, things like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't be the guy trying to say that academia is not a path of trying to pursue knowledge because what academia has done, and I've realized this from being someone who went from Manly P. Hall to uh, trying to take the academic approach, I think it's important to have a very solid methodology in how we're trying to come to a conclusion because – Look, you and me could pick up a Bible. We could have lived on a stranded island. We're born on this stranded island, taught a language from somebody, and then translated it into English. You and me could pick it up and come up with meaning of our own by reading this text. And that meaning may not have anything to do with what it actually originally was saying or whatever, but in our minds, we're right. And we think we've understood and grasped it. It's made sense to us and things like that. And I'm looking for tools to try and ground it, in, anchor it to not what it means to people in the 1500s, not what it meant to people, you know, today or even at some point in, in history, more about like, I want to get back for me, my drive is, what did this mean to the original listeners as much as I can, which by the way, that mission is not always something that can happen. That's why you have so many disagreements even in academia on what something means or whatnot. And that's my drive. It brings me back to my original point that I made. Why was it so necessary for every single civilization to encode their sacred texts? I think it's because... Just come out and say it. Well, I think the reason... Now, encoding, that's the practice that I was saying. I think they see time and the calendars sacred. I mean, it's how they survive. We went from hunter gatherers to agricultural. And I think we saw the sacredness in keeping the calendars and the heavens incorporated into timekeeping and when to plant, when to do all the stuff. So that's why I think you're right. Like the, it, it's funny what Jesus, the Bible never mentions Jesus being born on December the 25th, right? You bring this up. Well, no, why in we... fact, Christians will tell you he was born on September 11th or the Feast of the Tabernacles or around Passover. They'll throw right. And I'm saying, look, you can have those interpretations. That's fine. What I'm teaching you is the sun science as to why everything is December 25th. Well, that's that's the thing. Like it's I think they're incorporating that date and there is some reason that that date finds its way in and it's not. 
I don't think that this is something that we're finding biblically, but I think it's something that you find people who practice and believe in Jesus incorporate that science. Like the way that you are interpreting some of the images of Jesus with the heart on the outside and stuff. That's something I would imagine a Freemason doing. Uh, there's symbolism there because there is symbolism in the art. You can ask the same question. Why did Michelangelo incorporate some of the symbolic stuff into his art? Um, Freemasons, right? You, you you can look at them and whatever the craft is that they do, they 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 put the divine that they think into that craft. And so I'm assuming I, that you saw um, KRS-One's explanation of the Freemasons and Illuminati. Yes, yes. I've heard where I've you got that. that from. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he'll talk about the ship, right? But yeah. anything, it's not just about a ship and the, this is the God's mind and right. and the sail is God's wings or whatever. Right? I'm just, you know, throwing No, I, I know what you're trying to say, but when you said that, it just jogs my memory because I absolutely love that clip. Yeah, that was a really good clip. And I think people have written symbolically in that way. And I think it's hard to take, to take the devil's pulpit, right? right. Uh, the book, The Devil's Pulpit. He goes into the astro theology. He talks about calendars, this and that. He's he's trying to interpret the the narratives of Jesus throughout this calendar thing, and that's one interpretation. And for me, it would be better if we had early voices somewhere expressing and explaining these things, and not. Well, let me ask you a question. Can I just yeah. say one thing real quick? Yeah, I'm having way more fun having this discussion than doing my presentation. Dude, let's freaking talk. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I am too. Honestly. I mean. Look, um, I think you got a lot too. of it out too. And I know there's, bro, I know just to tell our audience, go yeah. subscribe. If you like what Mike is saying, um, he's got a lot of content on this. You've written books on this, so they can go deeper into hearing your explanations right. and what you've discovered. Um, but right. yeah, let's have a conversation and we'll take Q and a too. Cause we got super chats. Yeah, that's great. So, um, let me ask you a question though. Yeah. Do you think that, that sometimes the original intention what if it what if as time goes on the the intention or not the intention the original intention is there mm -hmm. <laughs> what they meant to say is there but what if over time it evolves into something that is way more useful and better for everyone then do you would you agree that the newer interpretation kind of supersedes the original one when things kind of take a life on their own so this is a really good question, Micah, and I'm glad that you asked me this. And I hope the audience is tracking along here. By the way, the reason I'm wearing my Dragon Ball Z hat is because I don't want my Super Saiyan hair to all ah! And then you guys see that I'm actually Helios, the center of the Zodiac. But anyway, um, no, seriously, me and Micah were doing this before. The sun was so bright that I was like blinding white. Anyway, yes, I think that. So here's my personal personal, right? We all have our personal. I think we evolved. And I think in that process, we're continuing to evolve ethically. Uh, we're continuing to evolve in terms of how we perceive the world, things like that. If we look at the analogy of the ancient Greeks, the philosophers, they mm. were some smart cookies, especially for their date. I mean, even till today, we, we quote Socrates. We quote, we're looking at these people going, wow, very smart people, Plato, all of them. We can disagree with them, but we could cherry pick, eat the meat, spit out the bone. What they yeah, people did, still talk about Plato's cave. Yeah, I use the analogy all the time. I'm not using it in the terms of Platonic forms the way right. he does. I use it in my own interpretation about drug addiction, escaping fundamentalist Christianity, and I'm going to be giving a presentation. Actually, it's funny you say that at a GCRR some conference where I'm using Plato's cave to try and give the analogy of what it was like leaving and where I'm at today and why. But amazing. It, it, yeah, he, it's it's like recycling. This is amazing and important. I think it's good to recycle the 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 philosophers who were smart, the very upper echelon of intelligence stopped believing Zeus actually had sex with, you know, women raping them, whatever. Uh, boys are involved in that as well. Like Zeus didn't do that. These are stories. So they found a way to allegorize much of what we find. And so you, I don't think that Odysseus and the Iliad are um, completely allegories. I think that they're writing narratives. However, interpretation changes over time and how I think philosophers look back on that and try to explain that even down into the first century. Uh, we've got some smart wizards like Jason Sobek in the chat and stuff 
uh, it'll talk about like Plutarch, his writings, and the way he understood Plato was born from a virgin birth, literally of the pneuma of God. Anyway, that they, the time goes by and the way they perceive the stories becomes more sophisticated, even if the original intent of the narrative wasn't that way. So if you hold sacred to the Greek story, all of a sudden later on, you have found a way, a science in your own interpretive models to make these more complex. And that's why when you started out uh, of the gate and we mentioned like waters, right? We know Aquarius is equated with water. But if I went into the Bible and I, or anywhere and I found waters in ancient literature, rivers, lakes, sea, you name it, right? Which the Sea of Galilee, I've got a bombshell uh, course coming up with Dennis McDonald to point out. Porphyry attacks or is writing critically of the Christians. And he's like, by the way, nowhere ever was this lake called a sea till you guys wrote your text, you know, in Mark. So he's already attacking saying, this is not the case. You guys most likely are attaching to the Mediterranean mythologies and the seafaring of Greek stories by equating this lake to a sea. It's not, it's a lake. You can see, if you're standing on one side, you could see the other side. Like it's not a sea. Anyway, I think that the models that Christians are starting to do, notice there's a big trend in Christians today that are trying to become universalist. There are early voices like Origen who thought, at the end, everyone goes back to the source and, and Christ will be all in all and have a pretty optimistic outlook at the end. But people are ethically and sophisticatedly changing. That sounds a lot like Christian mysticism to me. And it, th that's a thing that is happening. I think that they are becoming more over time, even with the Gnostics. <laughs> Look at how they do things with the New Testament. They're already starting to make more sophisticated interpretations and finding ways to make sense of evil. They have dualism. There's all sorts of stuff they're trying to do. Your question's a really good one. And you can see I'm excited about it because I think it's important to know anyone can have an interpretation and uh, yeah, yeah, I'll shut up. So that's the, that's basically the thing because what if the new interpretation supersedes the old interpretation and in the other way around, what if it doesn't? What if the new interpretation Goes, like, I'll give you the swastika, for example. Right. Right? The swastika goes all the way back. Ask your theology. The swastika is yeah. the North Star Polaris, and the Big Dipper on the solstices and the equinox is wrapped around it. And so you can see it in ancient Hindu art, right. you know, iconography and whatnot. Right. And so, yeah, but look at look at it now, right? You're like, yeah. ooh, we don't really want that symbol to be used. Right. And it's sad that that is what it's become because – you look back and everybody's triggered immediately seeing the image, but right. yeah, I get what you're saying. It has dominated the modern interpretation of what that becomes associated with right. ends up taking over. But I'm wanting for me, like I like to sweep away and get, and I'm sure you're the same way. Mm -hmm. I want to get back and try to figure out what that original intent was. And if you look at the original intent of a swastika, you're not going to think Hitler, you're not going right. to see it through the ugliness of what happened to the Jews. Right. That makes complete sense for sure. Yeah. Uh, you're very interested in what were people thinking when they wrote this down? I am. I, 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 the reason why is because you think intent, you think intention matters. I think if we're going to know what something meant, right. The only way to do that is this. I mean, I understand like, one of the issues, the reason why I'm glad you're asking this too, man, you're bringing it out of me. I was a fundamentalist, right? And when right. I had a specific point of view, I was right. And I used to harm others verbally. I used to harm people with my words about they're going to go to hell. Uh, other Christians weren't really Christian. Like my understanding was the right one. I was either this or that kind of Christian. My brand of Christianity changed and shift. I wanted to know what was meant I was into systematic theology books. I was reading commentaries. I was into the reformers for a while, became a Calvinist, got into eschatology. I really realized, oh my gosh, one day I, you know, you're studying this stuff, but it doesn't dawn on you. It was like an epiphany. It was like, everyone has a different thing. What the heck? And so I'll never get to what it meant by reading the interpretation of everyone else. I need to try and get back to what was meant if I'm going to understand what this was, you could see the same text being read by Gnostics, let's say, 
And then the same text read by heresiologists, let's just say, and you go, they're interpreting this completely different. I got to get behind the curtain as much as I can. So I am trying to find that out. And I know that some of sometimes that's not probably possible because we just don't have their vote voices on the side saying, this is what I meant. Um, we just have the text and then we have to try and understand that text. I want to get into what scholars say about it. But in that vein of the question, I had a phone conversation one time I called, um, I called a scholar and I, I, my, his name's blanking probably cause I need to eat at some point. Um, and he pretty much like argued with me on the phone. I was like, Hey, I'd love to have you come on the show. You're a wonderful PhD. I'd love to learn from you about the new Testament. And he goes, do you really care why Beethoven wrote his first symphony? Now, I don't care much about Beethoven personally. It's not my interest. So no, it was a bad analogy, but nonetheless, he was trying to point out, or do you care about how Beethoven's used today? Everyone doesn't care about why. I mean, there's very few people in the world who go, why did he write that? And what inspired him, influenced him? What are the mechanisms behind his first symphony? It's about the interpretation of that symphony that only matters. Everyone today is listening to Beethoven through their own lens and how they understand it, yada, yada, yada. For me, as someone who came out of the fundamentalist world, who wanted to get to the bottom of it, you had a thousand interpretations from a thousand different Christians who claimed they all knew what the heck they were reading. And I'm not, while that's interesting knowing how Athanasius allegorized the book of Revelation in the fourth century, knowing how Irenaeus found a way to interpret it, or Martin Luther, when he's getting persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church during the Reformation period, he first thought it wasn't part of the New Testament. Then, because he was being persecuted by Rome, started to interpret the Pope and the Roman Church potentially as this beast um, in Revelation, then it becomes part of his canon. He says, no, 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 actually, because it meant something to him. I'm more curious about who's John on the island of Patmos. Why is he writing this text? To whom would this have mattered? Who are the seven churches in Asia Minor in the first century, the late first century, who are probably dealing with Domitian persecution, which we know from other letters right there out the gate in the early second century? That's what I want to do. I don't want to personally go, well, the seven churches of Asia Minor are actually symbols and like run off into the la-la land because you could do that. You could do anything you want with these texts. I want to get to the core, the, the historical matter. I know no matter what I say or do with this channel, millions of interpretations will fly. Well, let me, put, let me put it to you this way. So Derek, I guarantee you, uh, you were on the phone with your mom when we were talking before yeah. we actually started recording, right? So you got your mom, you got your wife. She came in earlier too, okay? Mm -hmm. These are people that you desperately love. However, I guarantee you, and this goes for your followers too, or your, your supporters, your listeners. Mm -hmm. On my channel, I call them supporters. I don't call them fans because fan is short for fanatic. And I hope nobody's going to like misery me. But um, what I was <laughs> what I was just trying to say is, when it, when it comes down to it, no two people see you or think of you in the exact same way. Right. At all. So why would literature be any different? Well, ultimately, you can do anything with literature. You can. That's why I was saying methodology and how we're going to anchor this stuff down. And I think we have common ground. There is astrology. There is absolutely a science involved in the ancient world where Jews, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, you name it, all thought of sacred calendars and stuff like this, bringing it back, bringing your point back to what we're doing. Could I be wrong? For sure. I mean, like, in fact, I know that I'm not right about probably tons of stuff. And I know that there's limitations to what I can know. But I also know that if we don't have a methodology then I could go hand a translated Bible to a Hindu, right? And they will read it if they read it in Indian, let's say their particular dialect, and they read it, they would then interpret it through their own perceptions and give you their analysis, probably incorporating some of their religious background. Um, I imagine I have biases, right? So I'll probably bring my own stuff to the table. The, the only way I can get down to the meaning of a lot of this literature is to try and do this with good methodology. So if they went, if one of my family members goes, Derek's actually a wonderful guy, 
he's a great person who does no wrong. How could they show that isn't the case? Well, he argues with his wife or he um, uh, doesn't spend enough time with his kids or he doesn't pay bills or he whatever. You know, you can use whatever example. Yeah. You can find things to try and rule that out. And I guess I'm using that as my epistemology to the world. If I don't have grounded reasons to base something in reality and to know with good reason this interpretation makes sense in the cultural, historical, who, what, when, where, how, then I, I'll i say it's an interpretation, but I won't follow that lead, if that makes sense. I won't. But how do, you prove, how do you prove anything then? Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm, tr I'm trying to ground it using historical methodology. And, and if we aren't using those tools, we can't really come to what the text was actually trying to say, is what I'm saying. You can say that you think that's what it's saying, and you can do that by using some things. You're using some of these tools actually even in your presentation. For example, we talked about 144,000 though, and we went from 144,000 to chakras, right? Now, if I were to ask you like to press further, why did you leap from 144,000 Israelite virgins that are 12,000 from each tribe to chakras? What, what, where's the bridge between that and the interpretation of it being chakras. It just, it fits the overall esotericism that I keep seeing throughout everything, just an amalgamation of Eastern and Western philosophies. And it just, it, it seems like it's the most powerful thing that could be said. And I go on the basis that the Bible um, was a book where people tried to say some pretty powerful things. Right. Um, we can agree at the very least we can agree that taking it literally gets you nowhere. Well, yeah, I would, I, I mean, yes. At the end of the day, there's a lot of stuff that I think people are taking literal that is not, but then there are some things that I think there is a historical basis for. Um, for example, I think that Luke Acts used Josephus in creating the book of Acts. Josephus is a historian from the first century. Um, if we use the same interpretive model that you're discussing, for example, biblically, and we go to Josephus or we go to Philo or we go to wherever, um, we'll never really know what these historians might be trying to say if we interpreted them using water. He said water. He said a lake. He said this and that. He must be talking about Aquarius or something. I would not jump to that conclusion. I, I had imagined you but would it's either. It's just I'm, one interpretation of many. Right. But if we – we won't know anything if we jump to those kind of interpretations is my point. Well, why can't the Bible be a bunch of different holy sciences? Oh, I'm not saying it can't. For example, for Jesus is, is, is crucified in Golgotha, right? Well, Golgotha right. is the skull, the place of the skull. What's at the base of the two? The base of the two hemispheres. Right. I've heard place. that. Now, here's the question so I that's have. Anatomical. Right? That's that anatomical. That could make interpretation. sense. That could make sense, right? Now, here's my question. Has anyone ever – documented that kind of interpretation particularly on that that uh well i that can give passage. you i could show you the picture of the egyptian uh the eye of horus which basically mimics the pineal gland so but they this is know. the leap this is the leap i'm not look don't take this right. as i'm saying this could I'm be not, it. I'm not, listen this is a okay. friendly conversation <laughs> yeah I, but i want this to be an important point of where i'm coming from could it be sure because i also do think that osiris is almost like a you could almost say Osiris had some impact, okay? I think that Christianity early on had a serious rise in Alexandria, Egypt. So there, I imagine some Egyptian influence plays a role. How it happened, genealogically, in the culture, I don't know. But my point is, is I wouldn't jump from that to Osiris or in Egyptian mythology and say, here's what I found over here, therefore this is what this is saying. I would want more concrete connections to know that that is what was being said Well, what i try to do in my work is show you that you could argue you could argue that it's a bit of a leap to say aquarius i mean man uh baptism water pitcher those mm. you could you could agree with but then the water bodies maybe you don't fully agree with that, that that's fine but when you go through the passages as i have and i show these continual it's just not random signs in the Zodiac. The fact that there are signs in the Zodiac is one thing. 
Right. But the fact that they are constantly making the exact same patterns right. with the neighboring signs and the cross sign or the four, uh, the solstices and the equinoxes or the fixed signs or the, it's definitely there. Yeah, I'm not denying there aren't things there. I'm saying what we can't, how we would come to some of the conclusions. I'd be a lot more cautious before I jump to them. I mean, let me let me defend you here for a second. Right. Um, early on in the church, when the four gospels come up, one of the reasons they chose and stuck with four only is there's four cardinal, you know, directions: north, east, south, and west. Right. So, and they would have, you know, if you look at some of the church throughout time. They would have the symbol of either a lion for this gospel, Leo for Matthew. You'd look at Mark, you know, and so there is, I'm not denying any way, shape or form that there aren't people thinking in this way. Well, would you also know that the book of Mark is the oldest gospel, right? Yeah, earliest. You might 70 AD. Do you know what happened in 100 AD at the Senate of Jamnia? No. You never heard of the Senate of Jamnia? So no, for what's people for a lot of people, you, you, want, you want to read up on it, you can literally um, you can Google it because it's in the Encyclopedia Britannica. You know how they had the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD? Mm -hmm. Right? It's a similar thing. But what this was is the reason in 100 AD they had the Synod of Jamnia, and it was in Jamnia in Israel. The reason they had this was because the Old Testament, believe it or not, wasn't canonized in 100 AD. Right. The books were all over the place. They didn't have them in order. In fact, the book of Genesis isn't the oldest book. The book of Job is. And it's not it's, it's by far the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It's just placed in its location because they decided at this council with a bunch of politicians and early rabbis to do that. Now, one of the things they discussed that they were going to do is because the Gospel of Mark came out 30 years earlier around the time of the, uh, the destruction of the Second Temple of uh, Israel. And what they were going to do was they were discussing whether or not to put it in the Old Testament or create a New Testament with it. So, okay, this sounds a little bit, I've not read this, so I don't want to make any judgment calls on this, but I would need to look into this and find the source for this because I've never heard any of the academics mentioning this. And so what, and, and I know that when we started off, it sounds like you're a little bit suspect of academics in terms of their interpretation. I'm suspect of academics. I just think that the, the more interesting, I think that you have better syncretism with the sciences if you're able to free think as opposed, I put, right, it to you this right. way. I put it to you this way, Derek, like I'm not a mathematician, right? I can't think in terms of, of higher level physics, but I understand quantum physics. I just don't, I just can't do the math with it. Right. So right. I can't think in those terms. So yeah, I get it. But I, but this, my encouragement, while you're encouraging me to look at these other sciences more, and I should continue trying to look at these other sciences more, my encouragement would be also to look and try and ground and see what the academics are actually saying more. Cause I think you're right. There's stuff I'm not, but I'm also limited in how much I can read at once, how much I can take in at once. I know that it. problem. Believe me, people send yeah. me books all the time and book titles all the time. So I'm just very cautious about a conspiracy to invent and create the New Testament type of thing when we don't even have a New Testament that I'm aware of until Marcion. Marcion's the first guy that at least has a compiled— Which, by the way, the, the Gospel of Marcion de Sinop, I also ran this cipher that I came up with through it, and it shows patterns everywhere. This is— okay. This brings us back to another point, and I am suspect, okay? I, I wonder if— what you're the tools you're using can work with almost anything. That's why I'm saying methodology, because if I use your methodology and let's just say I go open up a book anywhere and I start reading a modern book off the shelf that I just but you, you have to understand what I'm showing you too. I'm not showing you just a single mention of twins. I'm not showing you just a single mention of a cow. I don't put those in slides. What I'm showing you is when they have eight, nine, 10 in a row. Right. That are all that all have to do with it. I mean, I, mean, I have the, one. Yeah, you know. Genesis forty nine rules off the list of the sons of Jacob and things like that. I definitely think there's some overlap with that in the describing them as animals that are particularly found in a zodiac. Um, I, you know, I, I would need to do a lot more research uh, diving into this to be able to solidify more of my position on astrotheology. I put it aside. Early on on Myth Vision, after listening to it for a year and a half or so before Myth Vision started taking off, but it's something I at some point I'd like to dig deeper into so that I could actually get make up my own mind about 
what I think is or isn't. I don't think the whole Bible, this is my thoughts, I don't think the whole Bible is astrotheology. I think that there's astrotheology that finds its way in this literature here and there. Plus, I also see that there are various genres, right? So I wouldn't take the poetry to mean uh, the law codes. I wouldn't take the law codes to be gospels. I would, you know what I mean? And so I would subset. Well, this, is why I start, this is why I start showing people when I explain the last Gao caves to show that we understood complex astrology 17,000 years ago. I start with that and then show you that it's only natural that you look at Goblaki Tepe, right? Mm -hmm. There was a section of it that was the uh, astronomical observatory. You look at the Antikythera mechanism, which has been recently shown to be a astronomical computer. Um, you could look at all these ancient sites. Um, I've actually seen that. The Greeks had a... Uh, the Greek computer, right? It's yeah, crazy. Yeah. Um, you can see all this stuff and you have to realize, I'm just drawing how important astrology and astronomy is. Do you know why? Because the Roman Catholic Catechism 2116. You want to pull it up and read it real quick? Sure. Because we can at least agree if we don't agree on the scope 2116 2116 the scope and the mass of astrotheology we can at least agree that it's in there right so yeah i think it's there all forms of divination are to be rejected recourse to satan or demons conjuring up the dead or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future consulting horoscopes astrology palm reading interpretation of omens and lots the phenomena of clairvoyance and recourse to mediums all conceal a, des a desire for power over time, history, and in the last analysis, other human beings, as well as a wish to uh, consolate hidden powers. They contradict the honor, respect, and loving fear that we owe to God alone. So let me ask you this question. If, if they know that there's astrology in the books, then mm -hmm. why is the Catholic Church putting in their edict telling you not to look into it because it's of the devil? I would imagine, and I'm throwing this out there. I don't know. I this is my methodology. When was this catechism written? What was going on at the time that this was written? Because I would imagine, just like the laws of the Bible, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Hint, hint. They had other gods before right. Yahweh. So somebody's doing this, and people who are politically in control at the time in the church want to enforce this to say stop. The same reason I would go. Why does the Roman Catholic Church n believe that Mary was perpetually a virgin when in the gospel she births Jesus as a virgin in Matthew and Luke, um, yet she immediately knows Joseph in the gospel? She comes to know Joseph after Jesus. Yeah, because that's what it meant when it says she knew him. That's what they right, meant. Right, sex. Yeah. So why would the Catholic Church say she's a virgin forever – Yet she has sex with Joseph according to the gospel. And so for what I'm saying is, is it's they have their own interpretation, and through time they want to control the narrative, and it's sacred to them. I, I just I would want to know when that was written, what was the circumstance? Are there people doing this stuff? Well, but you're right. There is, huh? you, know, you know how um, I told I tell you you're familiar that Aries is the beginning of the year, right? June yes. 1st, Nissan 14. It's spring. It's the right. new year. Did you know that that in the Egyptian times, the new year was actually in Virgo, the beginning mm -hmm. of the harvest season, whereas right. it was in spring now. And now we have it in January, which is who has a new year in, in the winter? That's ridiculous. So, but why in why in Egypt? Where does the story come from? Well, the the sun comes out of Leo. Okay, and the new so the newborn son comes from virgo a virgin right i have heard this and that mary would be virgo and and such to to interpret jesus being the son born out of virgo well, if you've ever looked at any picture if you've ever looked at any picture of her of her you know mary in a half shell if you've any look at any of those pictures of her on the uh, on the internet of her in mm -hmm. the, it's a vagina Right. I don't know if you've ever noticed I've, that too. But, I have seen I have seen pictures of what you're talking about. And part of me wonders if this is how things later get interpreted when people like Michelangelo who have an a, a way of of 
esoteric way in which they're portraying some of the figures and whatnot. I, I don't know. I mean, you find mushrooms in stained glass art and imagery in the church over time. Um, and I've heard some people go, well, that's evidence that Jesus was a mushroom. And I'm like, well, you know, let's not. Have, you read, the, have you read the mushroom and the sacred cross? I have not read it. I've heard it's super complicated. Um, I have it. But I can tell you this much right now. You know what manna is? In Hebrew, manna, when you say manna, it means what's this? It, what, how did they describe it in the Bible? It was a small, round, right. white thing. They'd walk up to it and say manna. They would eat it and they'd talk to God. It, it, you right. can make small use of magic mushrooms. Yeah, that's an argument that some people will make is that manna is psilocybin that appears out of nowhere in the morning and then it disappears and it comes back the next day. Um we got a couple super chats and let's hit these super chats here. Cause I don't want to leave people hanging for too long. Constellation Pegasus in the house question. How long does it take to observe to make a Zodiac? Oh my God. Okay. So this is how it works. Pegasus. I love all your comments. Keeping me busy. Um, this is how it basically works with the Zodiac. You have your 12 signs. Um, each one of them are roughly 30 days. So you have your 12 signs, and it goes from Aquarius to Pisces to Aries to Taurus as you go through the year. However, when you're talking about the great year, the zodiac year, it goes backwards. It's a procession. So it would go Taurus to Aries to Pisces to Aquarius. I'm going to answer the question. Each zodiac sign is 2,160 years. You multiply by 12, you get 25,920. That's called the great year. It would take at least that to fully understand. And the way that you understand the Zodiac, by the way, the way you understand what age we're in, whereas we're in the age of Aquarius right now, is you go to the equator. I'm not saying do this because this is like very complicated and time consuming and expensive. But you go to the equator. And then on March 21st, on the spring equinox, the sun's going to rise. The sun is going to rise. The sign behind the sun that it rises against, that's the age we're in. So how long to, to observe to make a zodiac? You could observe it in a year's time. But to understand the great year would be 25,920 years. Thank you, Constellation. I'm curious to know if they've mathematically figured out a way measuring small to get to that grand uh, explanation there. But yeah, that you're talking about the wobble of the earth on its uh, axis. And uh, Constellation Pegasus, again, you need to get Aaron Adair on how and how long it took the Sumerian Zodiac to be completed. I don't know if he in particular knows about that, but it wouldn't hurt to ask him. He's a good friend of mine. He's also a scientist and... Uh, and so I'd be happy to have him on and, and see what he says in particular on that. Uh, thank you so much, Constellation. Vesper in the house, can you show us exactly how you're using the her hero's journey or any other cipher gematria is used for decrypting astrotheology in the Bible, please? Can you show us exactly how you're using the hero's journey or any other cipher gematria is used for decrypting the history? So gematria. What do you mean by any other cipher gematria? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a gematria expert. Yeah, In I fact, know. I hate seeing that on Twitter where they're like, Michael Jordan's dad died. He was 33.33 years old. And then, you know what I'm talking about, Derek, right? When yeah, that's the problem, right? Like yeah, anything yeah. can go. Yeah. I'm not a fan of that. Um, that's why I'm not – that's why I'm – you understand, I hope, at least respect. But at the very I'm least, so. I hope that I'm a little more believable or it makes a little bit more sense. I mean, look, I think that if you if, – if you, couldn't follow or if you thought that it made zero sense you would have let me know immediately i think you said no, there's something no i'm to nice it. i'm a nice guy man i've had jesus on my channel and what i mean by that is i'm not kidding the guy from australia who claims to be jesus i interviewed he was Viserian? on my channel. huh is it Viserian? no it's that's the russian one i think um the guy from Australia, AJ, he goes by, I don't know his actual name. I forgot. It's been so long. But him and his wife, he believes that he was Jesus and Mary Magdalene was his wife. I've interviewed, I've literally interviewed Jesus. Now, I'm not saying you're Jesus. I'm saying I'm too nice. I'm a nice guy, okay? But I, I'm saying I, I could disagree with people and have conversations. And I also... um 
I believe my audience has good critical thinking skills and they can make up their own mind. Plus, I'm not here to control a narrative. I'm not here to tell people what they can think and what they can't think. There are some things I just don't do because it's just so far to me. It's almost like you're feeding into a troll, which would be the flat earth thing we were right. talking about before the episode. But no, like I, I don't think that you're anything like those guys, but I'm not the guy who's just going to cut you off and be sitting here trying to make you look dumb or anything like that either. No, it's not my goal. No, I'm, you know I'm, I'm slightly <laughs> better than Australian Jesus. You got to watch that episode. If you haven't watched that episode, I encourage you to get a laugh because this guy is serious as all get out. And he looks you in the eyes and goes, I am Jesus. And when I was there, he says some stuff that really did was really weird too. Can you send me the link? I will. I'll, I'll send it on Messenger when we're done. For sure. I think I'm going to take an edible and watch it. <laughs> You're going to do it. It's going to freak you out because I allow him to say what he – and when you listen, you're going to wonder like, dude, am I tripping? Like, is this guy like, what's wrong? You know, is this, what's wrong with the guy? You um, know what I found out, Derek, that freaks me out? What? This is totally off topic, by the way. Do so you know that I think it's up to 50% of people in the world don't have an inner monologue? Hmm. I didn't know that. Like I mean, you have not having that little communication with themselves, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. It's just like. And I've had I've had people that watch my channel that have emailed me and been like, "This is what it's like to me." To them, it's like they have a general idea what they're doing, but everything is like brand new. You ever see the movie Memento? No. Oh, it's where it, it's about short term memory, where you like you don't know what you're doing or you lose it every five seconds. Oh wow! Dude, they explained it to me. It freaks me out. Fifty percent of people, dude, fifty percent don't have inner monologues. I have never heard of that. That's interesting. Constellation Pegasus says, isn't it suspicious the fish was used to identify Christians? Perfect timing for the Zodiac sign. Hmm. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Um, it, you're, you're talking about, you were talking about going to, um, going to, in Israel, right? You saw a bunch mm -hmm. of floors. Well, yep. there's, let me show you one real quick. Hold on. Let I think me, it's on the thumbnail look. too. Let me share this again real quick. I know people yeah. don't like my presentation. But <laughs> no, there's some people who do. I'm just... I'm just voicing that there's definitely uh, different thoughts. Here we go. All right, hold on. Let me find it real quick. There's that. There's that. If you're watching, hit the like button, everybody, and subscribe to the guest if you like what you hear. Or subscribe to the guest and tell them off, whatever you want to do. You can do that too. You can go over there and tell them what you think. I'll just tell you I'm Jesus. That. Let me make that. I wish you could make that bigger. But yeah, there are tons of fish symbols. Yeah. So there's a town in Israel called Megiddo where a third century church was found under another church. Basically, someone put their foot through the floor and like they found a whole other church under it. It's one of the oldest churches known to man. This is from the 200s. In the center of the floor mosaic was a um, the two fish Pisces. Right there. And if you look at, um, if you're talking about, for example, I'll give you another example that you're going to say, I want to see the interpretation, but I'll give it to you anyway, just to see if okay. you enjoy it. Um, when Jesus is walking along the beach and they're fishing and they can't catch anything, he right. tells them to throw the net to the other side and they do, and they bring in 153 fish. Well, if you ever see two circles before that overlap, yes. It forms a vesica Pisces. That's the Jesus fish. They catch 153 fish. They're very specific with that number. Right. The mathematical equation of the vesica Pisces, the Jesus fish, is 265 over 153. I've actually dug deep into this one. And so, yeah, I'm aware of it also potentially sounds similar to Py Pythagoras story. And he, of course, is mathematics and stuff all day long. So, And 153 is a perfect triangular number. Um, there's all sorts of cool things about 153 and I don't know, I actually had a scholar come in and we went deep on 153. I think it was like a 200 or, or sorry, two hour, two and a half hour episode where we dug into various interpretations of the meaning. And he points out after he gives me like eight very complex arguments and I'm like, what the, and he's like, at the end of the day, like you can grab one of these and say that one makes sense. But you do so knowing these other models could make sense of the data. And I'm like, oh man, you're killing me with this interpretation. 
Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on that. Gary Stone, my buddy Gary, is coming out here, and we're going to be getting his story of leaving Mormonism. His family actually uh, goes back to the scribe. He's literally genealogical descendant of the scribe of Joseph Smith. So this is, yeah, man, look at that smile on your face. But I'm, I'm going to be interviewing him and getting his story, and that's going to be coming up in the next couple of months. He'll be out here in March. Original interpretations of the U.S. Constitution versus applying current understanding to the text is a constant debate. It's the same phenomena with religious text. One is conservative, the other progressive. And for me, Gary, I know you're going to relate to this. And Micah, you may relate. I hope you do. To me, knowing an original oftentimes shows you how people have taken it and like ran with their own. And oftentimes that helps free people from this fundamentalist. We have the correct understanding of the text because once you discover what it meant, I'll give you an example. This book right here, God and Anatomy. Anyone who reads this book, I promise you, you're going to have a new respect for like how wild the ancient Near Eastern deities were and how this God we call the God of the Bible is another ancient Near Eastern deity. God of the Bible, I'm going to be very explicit here. The God of the Bible had sex, had children, had a wife, was a son of a father named El, Yahweh. And like, once you start to see the literature and like go through what is going on, your mind will be blown. And God, God has some serious talk. It's really these people writing these stories and saying, thus saith the Lord. But like, there's all sorts of stuff that when you start to read it, you'll go, what? The Hebrew is a euphemism to mean God's dick. God has a huge one. According to the Bible, he has an, a huge one. But you got to read the book, well, according right? According to the Bible, he also shows Moses' his ass. So Yes. Is- Actually, she points out that that is a euphemism for like this area down here. And I had to stand up just to give you more example. Um, I know that it says back parts and you would think, but... And it could, but she pointed out that it, the, a lot of these terms are euphemisms in the Hebrew language to mean a very uh, private part and like what in the world? So I go back and I want to know the original, right? And you might call it conservative, but in fact, this is the funny part psychologically. Christians consider this liberal scholarship. They're not conservative. And the funny thing is, is the modern interpretations – are actually the ones who are liberal and not actually trying to get back to what the actual original was. So it's it's a very funny way in which we're trying to make sense of this, but I think it's very freeing to be free to interpret and go and try to find and discover how to understand these ancient texts. It's a great journey in, I don't know, I'm a weirdo and a nerd, so I like to do all this stuff. Eric, we got to finish up the Super Chats, man, because I got to run and have an interview. Okay, okay. Gary, appreciate you, man. Constellation Pegasus, again, evidently it takes 25,772 years for the Zodiac to cycle. Were humans able to see enough and calculate the cycle before it completed once? I think been, so. You probably don't, but I do. Might have been, there might have been some math they could do at the time, but you have to also... Yeah, well, it's, it's 25,920. There's They always tell you different... The 25,772, I think, is if you... Um, I've heard 26, off. and then I've heard... Yeah. yeah. Um, were humans able to see it enough again? I'm not going to lie. Look, this is speculative, but to be honest with you, we knew about this 17,000 years ago. Um, I think that this was given to us by someone because I find it so prevalent in everything that I read. And um, I, I honestly think it was given to us by someone. I know that's probably going to sound a little wild or so, but... It is. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people who think, you know. Why did they, yeah, yeah. So isn't the reason the ancient code. William Orens isn't the reason that the ancient code to the meaning of life is similar in many cultures because the universe to them had a cosmos that seemed to them the same size as the lands and waters of the earth or of earth. Thank you for that super chat, William. And Constellation. Thank you. I have no idea. I'm not going to lie. Like, I have no problem telling people I have no idea. 
Isn't the wow. reason that the ancient code to the meaning of life is similar in many cultures? I would imagine, I mean, it doesn't have to be about, I mean, I would imagine they all had cosmos, right? We can agree. They all had a cosmos in their mind. They all had lands and water. And and, and somehow this factor. I mean, in. Too, they, there was no, there was no air, there was no air and noise pollution back then. There was no industrial era. There was no machines just pumping out smoke. There was no chemtrails, contrails. There was none of that kind of stuff. They could go out and it was like Aurora Borealis. They would just see everything. So I don't think for me that that in answering this question, because to me, that's a whole different uh, right. topic. Um, I would say I think the reason people have similar codes and narratives is because humans tend to have similar experiences physiologically, right. psychologically, I would say environmentally. Um, but you also see differences in their, in their stories and uh, depending on where they're from, but you'll find commonality because we're all human. I mean, we're all, we're all humans trying to work this thing out. We call life. Yeah. I mean, you'll find out, you'll find too, that um, the sun tells the hour of the day, the moon tells the day of the month and the Zodiac tells the month of the year. So where we're located in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, kind of on the corner to the left in the middle of nowhere, certainly not the middle of the universe, uh, where we're located in the Milky Way galaxy, there is a perfect solar calendar that we have figured out. Mm. Thank you, Jaka Latte. Latte? Latte? Jaka Latte? Thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate it. I didn't see, I wanted to make sure I didn't leave you hanging before we go. That you had a comment or something, but you're just throwing uh, throwing a five at us. I really appreciate that. Look, um, I really do appreciate your time coming on here, and thanks for just deciding to have a conversation for the next hour. Listen, listen, I would, you know, I know you're a super busy dude, but maybe in a couple months we could just come on and just have a conversation. I would like what what I would like is I would like to read more on this topic. Um, and then dive into astrotheology again, giving it what I think is solid, and then you know go from there. I mean, we could have a conversation, but I'd like to, I'd like to get versed in it. It's been a long time since I was in my Manly right. P Hall phase and going through all that. Right. But I'd like to read before we end up doing an episode, so that we could find common ground and I can go in and you know we can talk about where we're yeah. in agreement. Yeah, just give me a couple topic ideas. I'll do some research too. Okay, just hit me up, man. Derek, man, it's been, like I said, way more fun to talk to you. You're an awesome dude. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm thankful that you're not like hating me at this point for being just poking and like giving my thoughts. I hope no. people check you out. Like if you like what you heard or you didn't go harass him in a positive yes. or negative way, go harass him, show him some love on the YouTube channel. Mike is just on a journey like everyone trying to figure things out and, um, you can't hate the guy, even if you disagree with him, right? I mean, you could hate him, but come on. Why would you want to Don't do hate that? Me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm show love, show love. I'm harmless. But yeah, go check him out. Go show him some love and um, and then show him critical. I mean, look, Micah, you're willing to learn, right? If someone in the chat is thinks they got something you don't or they found something out you haven't, go let him know. I mean, don't let him stay in the dark. If you know something and you want to approach that conversation, please feel free to. Also, though, um, go listen to what he has to say, and maybe you can learn something from him as well. And I think we can all learn from each other and have these conversations. I actually told my mom this the other day, Micah, before I let you go. Um, the problem is we don't talk to people enough from different viewpoints, different religions, things like that. So we have built up stereotypes about other people, and specifically right. my household. You know, my dad went to war in Afghanistan, and was he was over there during the whole stuff since 9-11 onward. And so there's a big Western stereotype of Muslims. And it's like, if you actually befriend some and you get in conversation with them and you get to know them, you'll find out their parents, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, human like you, they're just, they have a different story in which they're trying to understand the world through different culture. And it breaks down those kind of stereotypes that allow for bigotry or racism and things like that. So it's a good practice to have to have conversations with other people that you don't agree with or you have common ground with, but you can discuss those dis disagreements too. You know what I mean? I agree, man. Thanks for having me on, Derek. I appreciate it, man. You're getting love in the chat, man. Thanks, love. guys. Come over to my – listen, my social media is Micah Dank, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Micah Dank. 
If you want to see that pretty mug again, go check him out. Check out that stash. I mean, come on. Who doesn't want that stash, right? <laughs> um, seriously, though, um, Jesus, just look up Myth Vision. Ooh, I guess I do need to do this real quick. The Myth Vision AJ interview. Australian Jesus. Myth Vision. Australian Jesus. You could take your edible and then go watch this. And by the way, I have a follow-up interview I did with one of his early disciples, if you will. And well, that's got to be even worse. Oh, it's it's a little weird because he started to say that like people were diagnosed. You could tell there's like some pseudo science in his mind. He thought that um, people who are diagnosed with um, schizophrenia are actually – those are real demons actually talking to him or spirits and demons and that there isn't a real psychological issue so that they should just embrace the voices and stop taking medicine and stop going to the hospital for that. And I was like, that's dangerous as hell. But it's like the worst advice. I wouldn't. It is the worst. Yeah, bro. I mean I was like, what? But he also was saying stuff about this guy who – that says he's Jesus with all confidence at one point was going to send an email out telling everybody, all right, I'm not really Jesus. And like, he goes, <laughs> this, bro. All right. Did I do it? Here we go. Posting it again. I posted it in the chat. I'm going to send it to you on messenger. If you want to get a laugh. Yeah. Send it to me on messenger. Go check it out. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, you can disagree at the end of the day, whatever. Like the video, drop a comment. Love you. Never forget. We are myth vision. Micah. Thanks a lot, man. Enjoy your evening. You too, man. All right.